You know, we need unions now more than we have in the past, right? It's not a diminishing need, I think there's an increasing need. I'm happy to be a USA member. I'm happy that USA is there to advocate for us. You know, if you run a union democratically, and I think we did, and I'm not sure all unions are so democratic, I think we were actually very democratic in a way that I didn't appreciate until much later on when I started to understand practices in other organizations. Having the members um, really be engaged in what the union was doing and what the community at large was doing. Yeah, I, I don't think that USA would be successful if it didn't go to its members and say, we have to do this, and you know, this is what we think. More people should be looking at how they can unionize and how we can get more people into organized labor. I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a struggle and it's a very important struggle for, for our time right now. I think we would do well to look at, again, the term union, a union of people coming together. Like, how is it wrong to want the best for people, to promote diversity? How is that wrong? I think that's what this union has done very well in the last few years, is mentoring and training new people to take over. I just want to say how proud I am to work for this union and be um, a part of this union. The members are, in my opinion, the, the best people and I love the role that I have. The union offered me more opportunities than my manager ever could. You know, I'd like to, uh, I guess, acknowledge um, all the people who've come before us and all the people who've, uh, you know, who had the foresight, right? Because, uh, you know, I mean, I can't imagine what uh, our founders went through, you know, in the whole process of organizing this. You know, I, I have my own experiences now, but I can't imagine at the time what they might have endured. I'd just like to acknowledge those people, all of them. I mean, I don't have all their names, but <laughs> and all the people who don't get the um, the praise or the the admiration that they deserve as well. So I came um, at a very young age, in my early 20s, to start working at York. And uh, I didn't have that much uh, experience in terms of a job. I became to quickly realize that although there was that uh, you know, notion that there were no barriers, there were barriers. Um, I was definitely, as part of the secretarial pool, I think what happened to me personally is that I started to grow up. I was very much interested in the notion of democracy at the university. I felt that there were a lot of injustices, and the longer I worked there, I, the more that I saw on a very personal level. We did, we did however, have some help uh, from uh, Judy Steed. Uh, company of Young Canadians uh, organization um, that, and she worked with us uh, every week. So I was uh, a very naive person from downtown Toronto and uh, was sent up to York University. A sort of a feminist attitude was beginning to develop and so in a way it was kind of like consciousness raising groups at lunchtime, people with their lunch and the story that of course hit me, woman after woman after woman would tell us about training some new young guy for the job and then he would be promoted over her and it just happened over and over again how the women were never recognized for the skills they had, for what they contributed, and then, uh, then these young guys who didn't know anything, who'd be trained by the women, and they would make their way up the ladder, and the women never, there was no ladder for the women to go up. 
because many of the women uh, working on the staff in secretarial positions were relatively young, as Gabrielle was, and there were no labels for the attitudes and the sexism. I can think of one instance where the wonderful woman had a Master of Arts degree. So of course she, and she was hired as a secretary. The expectation that as a secretary you would be, you know, serving coffee to profs. You know, Yusa was, was very much rooted in the feminist movement. It was an organization of women. The leadership of the union was, were predominantly women. The, it uh, was engaging on issues that affected women. A whole struggle over daycare, right, uh, you're, uh, on campus here. Yusa was instrumental. It was crucial that we were women, yeah. and that we were, and that Gabriel was a peer, mm -hmm. and that um, that they could perceive that she was working out of the same type of environment, dealing with the same kind of um, disrespect and uh, lack of opportunity. You know, a lot of people for a very long time just spoke about uh, how they were dissatisfied. So there was a lot of discussion about being dissatisfied, uh, yet there was no action. In the beginning, uh, USA was, uh, well, and still is an association, but it was not unionized. I'm not sure that we were thinking unionization in the beginning. Uh, we were still naive enough to think that if we were just a little stronger in our voices, a little stronger in our demands, and, uh, you know, want just a little more share. I proposed to, to Gabriel and to a number of people that what, they, what should, they should do is that they should run for office of, uh, of USA if there were an annual election, develop a slate that was clearly designed. The whole purpose was to change USA from this association into a union that would, uh, I think the phrase we use, that would come under the protection of the Ontario Labour Relations Act. When we were organizing originally, I had a visit from one of the vice presidents of the university. He asked me to cease and desist organizing and that I was a woman obsessed. We said, you know what, uh, I think we have to unionize. When we uh, got to talking about what we were doing and in this very innocent way started going around and meeting with uh, the staff, most of whom were women, at lunchtime and talking about their working conditions. You've got to uh, plan it out really well. Plan it out really well. Be prepared for uh, a long haul and a, and a big fight. Uh, a lot of people were curious. This is the first time that uh, anyone from USA had gone around uh, to speak to, uh, to my knowledge, to speak to groups of staff. We needed to have, have uh, the staff understand what it, what it would mean to be unionized. Because the actual going around campus, having people sign a card and give you a dollar bill to say that they wanted to be in a union, that, that was a huge effort. So getting those numbers uh, that were required by the Labour Board and getting those names to the Labour Board, that was a huge event. The organizing was very grassroots, it was very democratic, it was widespread, everybody was invited in, you know, it wasn't cliquey, you know, we couldn't find, there wasn't a, a room big enough for the use of meetings that we held at this time. You know, there were, we'd have the largest uh, lecture halls that hold, held, I think, 600 people, and people would be lined up outside and, you know, they'd be packed, you know. There was a big uh, excitement for me when, when I received a letter from the president of York University barring me from the campus and I was a persona non grata and I was to be thrown off campus if I dared to step foot because this was of course when 
um, the president's office realized that we were having success with organizing the union. So I was thrilled that, uh, that this was a mark of uh, real progress on our behalf. I was 24 years old. I had a car, an apartment, a job. Everything in life to make you happy, right? Well, one day something happened. And for the first time in my life, I had to really think. And then it was also uh, Gabriel's role in um, going around and meeting everybody. So when you've got a story with a, a really strong narrative arc, you've got a heroine who's leading the charge, and then you've got all this detail mm -hmm. about what goes into forming a union, it really was kind of a no-brainer. Uh, Barbie, why, why don't you uh, come right here and sit on the vice president's lap? Well, why not? Oh, wow! What do I tell everybody? <laughs> now, uh, tell me, Bobby, uh, what, what do you know about this uh, union? Oh, uh, not nothing. <laughs> oh, well, uh, Bobby, do, do you think you could do me a little favor? Sure. But, uh, maybe, maybe you could uh, go around and find out everything that you know about the union. Oh. Oh, okay, sure. Good, good. Well, why, why don't you just run along and uh, just run along now and uh, do that? And at Theater Pass Marai, you work get to work collaboratively um, with a group of actors, and um, so we kind of that I was the one who had the overview, the experience, the story, and then we could put the whole thing together. So we decided that we had to find out what the rest of the staff felt about unionization. Uh, we were just a very small group of people. And because the staff association elections were coming up, we thought that it might be a good idea to run a slate of candidates on a union platform and turn the staff association into a union. And I met uh, the woman that played me, yeah. you know, plus, other, plus others. And she kept trying to figure out how to play me, you know, trying to look for you know, certain character traits, yeah. you know, she says, do you smoke? I said, no, do you do this? I said, no, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing. I'm just, I'm just an <laughs> ordinary person. There's yeah. nothing, you know, yeah. there is nothing yeah. earth shaking about me <laughs> that would differentiate me yeah. from anybody else. Yeah. There. Yeah. And so, but she glommed on to the fact that I like Mickey Mouse. And so in fing Operation Finger Pinky, uh, at one point in the background in the office, there was a calendar, a Mickey Mouse calendar. So, <laughs> so for those in the know. <laughs> I think once we got very close to what we needed, if we weren't going to have enough, we would just go out and get more. Um, we, would, we would continue with the drive. Um, we were on a roll. It was just a matter of people power, getting to the people and getting the cards signed. Uh, USA got certified, I mean, this, and then uh, went through this year-long procedure at the Labour Relations Board to, um, uh, to identify the bargaining unit. And since it was the first university in Ontario where the support staff were organized, this was like breaking new ground. It was very technical. We, we did get a letter uh, from the Labour Board uh, officially saying that we were certified. Uh, that letter might or might not be in the archives of USA now. Um, it should be framed. <laughs> it should be framed. Uh, and it was exciting, but you know, some of these things in retrospect, we should have celebrated more. Uh, we should have appreciated what we had done, but we were always looking ahead. I know that once we, we were granted certification, it was almost anticlimactic. We were exhausted. We were exhausted because we had to get energy up 
for the next phase, which was even more important, and that was getting ready for the, negotiating the first contract. In the early years, USA was the was on the cutting edge of labor relations at the at, at York. I, I think it's fair to say that it was USA that was stirring the pot. That the CCU would um, provide support in the form of of me, you know, sitting with the committee and negotiating a collective agreement, but it would only be uh, uh, on the condition that C that USA would have to affiliate with the CCU, that we couldn't do it if they were, you know, as an outside organization. So that went to the USA uh, executive and membership, and people voted to affiliate with the CCU. We were uh, trying, to, trying to learn about other contracts. We were trying to memorize bits and pieces of, of you know, other unions and you know, what should we have in our contract? What should we suggest to the membership? Because once, once we had uh, a draft of what should go forward to, the, to be bargained on, you know, our membership needed to be apprised of all that. And, and we would need their vote to go forward. I think that was the most important achievement, was the, was the first contract. And as president, I was part of the bargaining committee, but there was a bargaining chair. There was no use of office. Um, I worked as an admin assistant in Calumet College. You know, every lunch hour, I was in my office uh, with either the vice president or some other people holding little meetings, preparing for our next meeting. Uh, this was a non-paid position. That did not come till much later. Uh, when I was USA president, it was totally voluntary and I had my regular job and then that was a, a separate job. When Gabriel was done, she was done. She was tired. She had gotten USA going, you know, had done all this enormous work and enormous pressure. I can't even imagine. And she was just, she said, I, I can't do this anymore. And she said to me one day, she said, you should run for president. And I said, um, no. <laughs> I said, no, I, I don't know what to do. And she said, well, yeah, you do. I mean, ultimately people do rely on one person sometimes, right? Like there's a phone call. And sometimes it's like, okay, am I gonna be able to have the right answer for the person, the use of member on the end of the line, right? Because we're still new, we're still trying to figure it out and how am I gonna have that answer because people's livelihoods are at stake. But, in, but you know what, it's like there's enough people around and I had gotten to know people in the CCU by that time and uh, so I knew that there was strong support for what USA was doing. And so I said yes. And the team around, like the, you know, the executive, the shop stewards, it was a good, solid group of people. And then the women, like Laurel Ritchie, and of course the Madeline Perrant. I mean, oh, just saying her name, just, you know, she taught me a lot about empowering women, you know, the textile workers in Quebec and how they fought. And there's this woman, this gracious woman with this tough, tough, toughness. She taught me how to stand up, how to stand up for myself and the union members, not for myself so much, but how to stand up for what is right. And remember, you know, when we went for that first strike vote, where we went and told our members, we need the strike vote because they don't believe that you're serious. You know, there was some fear there, and that's certainly one of the reasons I visited the picket lines regularly, but there was also enough strength there. There was enough strength that people who were afraid and who had the fear just stood beside the people who were strong and, um, you know, walked with them. I remember the first morning going to the picket line, so there's quite a few entrances. I don't know how many there are now, but I think there was about seven then. And, um, and I didn't know what to expect. And uh, 
there they were. There they were. I just feel emotion now, like all these years later. But there were the women, standing strong at every entrance, many of them, and marching with their picket signs. I mean, feeling so strong about what they were doing. I remember one woman running up to me because I visited all of them right first thing in the morning. One woman run, running up to me and saying, Lama Lama, the police were here. And I told them we had a right to be here. I said, good. And she said, yep. In fact, she went to the picket line. That was so, like, that was like, that, and I, just the empowering. I don't think I can use that word enough of how a union and its members, like how we empower each other, you know, to do the right thing. And, and imagine a bunch of women, right? A group of women saying, we have the right to be here. And just doing it in, you know, a way that's coming from a place of strength. It was awesome. It was awesome to watch it. It was a real gift. It's an annual luncheon that sort of just gives them the opportunity to come and say hello to people that they don't often get to see, come back to their old stomping ground. The Retirees is a very special event to both us and them. The Retirees Luncheon was such a simple idea. Again, I think it was in, in around early 2000s. And it just struck me that we didn't have an ongoing connection with our retirees. And uh, I thought it was important that we should. These were the people that we've all stood on their shoulders of over years. I think it's very important that our retirees come back every year, right? And we, we get a large number of them, like usually over 100 of our retirees come back and they reconnect with their old colleagues, with their union brothers and sisters. And you see how happy, like people are, are very happy to, to see uh, everyone, to reconnect with everyone. I talked about our member who was just celebrated his 100th year uh, birthday and he had retired in the 1980s, but he still comes back. This is a very special event for us. Uh, the Retirees Luncheon is one of the highlights of the year for USA. And because those of us who are still working owe every one of you an incredible debt of gratitude. You, know, you guys did all the work for us and we are reaping the rewards of your hard work. So you guys all deserve a great round of applause. I guess near the end of 83, I had finished my master's. I was still working full time, also being an admin assistant for the Robart Center for Canadian Studies. My first day was a strike vote, so that was very interesting. And it was totally divided and people yelled at each other. So that was my introduction to USA. It was probably a really exciting time to do that kind of work. Um, the 80s were a big time of change. You know, we didn't get our human rights code until 81. The government was in the process at the time of whether or not there was going to be pay equity legislation. So there were all those kinds of equality rights things. Dumping computers into uh, people's offices was a rather major issue. So the whole issue of tech change, the introduction of computers into the offices, the lack of training for people when they got those things dumped into their, and they literally often had them dumped into their offices. So there were a lot of basic things. So besides the thing that you plunked these things, and in some cases they took their typewriters away, and some techie came in and set it up and said, here, you touch this and do that, and like, away you go. People thought that if they used computers all the time, that would make them skilled, and because that's how it seemed then, because they were new. But really, they could be very de-skilling in terms of the work secretaries did. We, we bargained during working hours unless there was a good reason not to. None of this all-night stuff with employers waiting until midnight to give you something so that you're the ones who have to sit up all night. Like, uh-uh, employer game, no more. We just weren't getting very far in bargaining in 87, as far as I remember. I think we thought we were getting somewhere, and the university was quite determined, I think, to have a two-year agreement, and we weren't ready to agree to a two-year agreement. It was, we were up for about two and a half weeks, and at that time, that was one of the longest strikes in the English-speaking university system. You know, there's a point at which you, it's like, what do you do, you know? 
he say, okay, I'll take this and like walk all over me or, and you know, it was a women's union and I, but it was kind of like, stop treating me like a doormat, you know? But I absolutely, I absolutely was proud and, and honored and privileged to have done that work. And I'm gonna get teary because it's really, it was everything to me. And it's true, it's really true that everything I learned, I learned in my union. Do you miss those days? You... Sometimes, yeah. yeah. I couldn't do it again. And, and I, it's, it's, it takes too much out of you. Well, a lot of being the union president is quite painful, <laughs> frankly. It's very, very tense. And, you know, if you're a person like me who's not really, really doesn't want to be in a conflict situation most of the time, it was extremely difficult. I, you know, I worked 70 hours a week and slept every other night. We obtained benefits for same-sex couples in our collective agreement, which was quite a, you know, an, an early uh, manifestation of that kind of equity, and we're proud of it. We were one of the first groups anywhere who negotiated same-sex rights. And it was everything except pensions, because at that time you couldn't have a pension plan that would recognize the same-sex spouse. Our lawyers told us we couldn't demand that too. Which we would not have done if we hadn't had a person on our executive who was a gay man who said, you know. And so without Greg Jacobs, who is also not with us um, and died some years back, without him, it wasn't like, we just never thought about it, you know? And that's the other part of a lot of learning. And the university resisted that because then we don't know what it's going to cost. I said, well, you don't know what it's going to cost for family benefits. You never ask people if they're married and how many children they have. And we just kept saying at the table, look, if York University wants to continue to discriminate against same-sex couples, then that's what you're doing. I felt really good about that, but I also knew, you know, it, it wouldn't have happened if Greg hadn't said something. And, and I think that's due in part to the very forward-thinking leadership of this union. I think the people who, you know, ran the union in the, in the late 80s really knew their stuff on human rights and equity and really worked hard to make changes that would benefit the entire membership and we're proud of that. The other things that, that came in that time period that the union had to consider is the pay equity legislation that came into being in the minority government in the late 1980s that mandated uh, pay equity be tackled seriously in the public service. Our lawyer told me that the use of pay equity settlement was the second largest in the province and I reactivated the pay equity committee in 1991 and what that job evaluation system did for us was to come a good way towards obtaining equal pay for work of equal value, which is what we were after. After I was president, there was someone hired to look after job evaluation, and then eventually a vice president was brought into the union office full time. And then eventually another vice president was brought in, and the number of staff members has increased. So there's outreach efforts all the time to the membership, communication efforts, these are great things. I miss a lot of the people, but you know, they all have their lives too. It, I felt very alive during this time because I was completely stressed out of my mind. <laughs> I've never been that stressed since. There's nothing very exceptional in what I did do. It was just sticking to a problem that needed to be solved. And I think one of the things you learn when you're union president, and Celia said this to me, she said, you trust your membership, you listen to them. I moved up from the States in 1980. Um, I had been very active in unions down in the Missouri area, and down in St. Louis area. We had one part-time receptionist and clerk. It was literally on a shoestring budget. It was a difficult time in many ways. There was no respect. USA members were considered 
expendable. We were, you know, the secretarial staff, the people who were told to go get coffee, to uh, go out and pick up my dry cleaning, to, uh, you know, walk my dog. That was the sort of thing that people were putting up with, and that's what we were working to eliminate. Everyone deserves a safe space, that everyone deserves respect, everyone deserves um, equal opportunities. And one of the programs that was started was a safe space, um, identifying physical locations where someone who was feeling threatened, someone who was feeling uh, put upon, uh, nervous, or just someone needing a place to escape to, could come and feel like they were safe, it was peaceful. Uh, the USA offices wa were one of the first physical locations on campus to be designated as that safe space. There were a number of people who were associated with the USA at the time who fought against that, who said that's not an appropriate thing for a union to do. My argument always was, it is the most appropriate thing for a union to do. We represent all members, not just a few. And then came the introduction of the social contract and the expectation that all public sector workers would give up five days every year free work uh, in order to try and balance a budget. That was not received with a great deal of joy among most unions in Ontario. We went through a period in the 90s when Ike Harris and his Common Sense Revolution uh, took control of the legislature with a major majority. Um, his promises were to preserve education, um, health care, infrastructure, and um, support the municipalities. His first acts were to cut funding to hospitals, um, cut funding to colleges, universities, and schools. We are still struggling to recover from his stupidity of the 90s. We see it here um, now in Ontario. We saw it in the 90s in Ontario from both a left-leaning and a right-leaning government. Um, we've survived all of that. We've had attempted raids by the CAW, uh, by CUPE, and by OPSU. Uh, we've survived those, and we survived it because we are a democratic union. We never attempted to stifle debate or discussion at executive board. Executive board gave me direction. It wasn't the other way around. The, the most important thing is that we're a collective of people. Like the, the idea of solidarity is very important to unions. And individually, you know, individually, there's no way you can stand up to a big employer. I mean, the nature of the employment relationship is always that the employer, they own the place. You know, if you talk about union dues, right, you know, our members, we get 1.5% uh, allocated towards union dues, which go to the union, right? And 1.5% one, 1. to each individual person, yeah, it's, it's, it's a cost, but it allows the union to hire top quality legal representation. So if any one of those members has a problem, then, you know, we've got the union behind you, you've got our legal counsel behind you. So York University has a number of different unions on campus that, that represent different groups of employees. Now, what USA represents to administrative, technical, clerical, and secretarial. And we're also what's called a, a tag-end union. So that basically means anyone who didn't end up in any of the other unions, you basically go to USA. Yeah, we can change the drop-in. Drop in. Yeah. And that should really be made very, very clear. Um, that way, if our minutes should ever be audited, it would be very transparent who the auditor is. WSIB or whatever, too, though, because people need to know. We need to have it documented that these are the firms at the time from the board meeting or from the minutes. really love it to be honest like I quite enjoy it I mean yes there are times where you're gonna have different people of different passions and different viewpoints sitting at the executive board table and you're not gonna agree with everybody all the time it's just not gonna happen 
I don't know, I would just say that the people around the table have a heart of gold. Like they just, they want to be there. Obviously, they want to be there. We're here in the evenings, after work, volunteering our time. And if you weren't passionate about the union, then you would never step up to, to, to participate in that. I really want to uh, appreciate that you're here on the Saturday and Sunday. You've worked all week. Um, I'm going to put you to work, and uh, you're here today. So, so thank you very much. As members, we're voting on this, and we 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 only have like minutes. Um, that they're timely. Um, there's a timely response to the complaint when something happens, you don't try to report it a week or two weeks later, you report it right away and what that means. And the changes of job duties, hours, Ooh. and employment category, which is a juicy one, is, a juicy one yeah, uh, <laughs> is here. I think that it would be useful and uh, uh, talked with Sonny, he's comfortable with this. We're alerting ourselves so everybody's up to speed on all three. You, we need to get people involved. So one of the things we're doing now is we're training our stewards. We have, we have a fairly large pool of stewards been more of, more of just, oh, they're out there, they convey information between the union and the membership, but they haven't been in meetings representing members. And so what that's done is, is it's push, pushed up a lot of that work to the, to the top, right? So to the, to the, to the full-time officers. And so that takes a lot of our time. And so what I really want is to train our stewards uh, to be doing more of these meetings. So very important, if you're out here, your knees are, a bit, are visible. When you move in, your knees are not visible. This is about security, coverage, defense, right? Uh, it's about power. We're talking about the power dynamics. Darcy Martin is a really good uh, trainer, and uh, what I like about it is we've reached on, we've talked about topics that we've talked around before a number of times within steward meetings, but today we're getting a little bit deeper in some of these topics. And even though I've been a steward for a long time, and done, I'm learning stuff today that uh, it's a, not only a great refresher, but it's new to me. I've been a steward for four years now and counting, and I'm always excited by steward training. This one's been interactive in a very fun way, so um, we've gotten to learn while we've actually gotten to apply what we've been learning, so it's been a great experience. And it was very uh, encouraging to me. I'm optimistic about the future of this union. So, thank you. Thank you. The USA office, the union office, we're actually located at the sort of extreme corner of the campus. So it's, it's difficult for people to get out and see us. So one of the things we started, and this was, Julio actually started this, I think uh, about two and a half years ago, is that we, we allied with our friends in the uh, Graduate Students Association, and they offered us to use some of their space, which is very central. It's very centrally located on campus. So we felt it was important to just bring the office to them. So we found a central location where, you know, it would only be like five or ten minutes for people to come to us from their office space and then they could ask their questions and all the officers go. Sometimes we have stewards who attend as well. Um, anybody who's available should come and can come. So yeah, so for benefits, there's a, there's a for the eye benefits, there's a two-year period, right? right? And it's yeah. a set time to a set time. Uh, let me just start. Based on my annual year. Is no, it's not based on, it's the same for everybody, right? So September. Oh, it's, it's, it's not written there, but it starts in September. Um, so, so because of that, we just wanted to say, hey, you know, the, the, the leadership of the union, we're here, we're accessible. Any member can come in and, and drop in and talk to us, uh, you know, 
every single week. And even you know outside of the office hours, of course, you can still call, you can email, whatever. We, we respond to people all the time, but we actually just wanted to physically put ourselves right in the center and, and make ourselves accessible. It's good to get to know who your executive are so when there is an issue, you know who you're talking to, right? So they're not like, you know, total strangers, basically. Like we're here to be approachable and open. I think it's a great opportunity for USA members to get together and enjoy a nice meal and it's a wonderful team building endeavor. It's the only opportunity they have to meet with their friends on a, um, a recreational basis which is still a great opportunity for, the, for them to get to speak to their executive members. This is a really fun event. We do it every single year to recognize you know, the greatness of our membership. How big was it this year? Because I hear that tickets it's sold out. Biggest ever, uh, like 1,100 tickets. Yeah, it's usually around 1,000 people, but this year we had well over 100 extra people requesting tickets, so it's really popular this year. Joni Cameron Pritchett was the president at the time um, and I was teaching fitness classes in Barrie through the city and she began attending um, my classes regularly and um, we did know each other also before that and she um, asked me if I'd be interested in coming in one day a week and just doing sort of a, a Zumba class is where it started for the members um, which took off like wildfire. I pitched to the executive board that we should create our own fitness program here in the union office and people thought I was crazy. Like some of my most uh, beloved colleagues who have now retired literally said that I was crazy and that it would never work. And we thank you so for uh, putting this in place. It's about nine years that it's going on. I've uh, participated from the very beginning and I also know when I do not participate the effect that it has on my body. The program is, continues to grow, which obviously I love. So it went from Zumba to a Pilates yoga class on Monday and then we threw in a strength training course or class area and now we've got a full week's worth of, of workouts Monday to Thursday. Uh, which refers not to stop thinking or emoting, uh, but to follow that process. And of course, try to maintain those processes you know help you stay calm, like breathing for example. three times a week during lunch times as well. We now have meditation. So maybe if you're a little bit more into, uh, you know, working out your mind instead of your body, we, we have that as well. And again, it's, it's the same thing, just to give workers a time during the day where you can kind of relax, you know, help build your contemplative sort of practice and, and help your mental well-being and physical well-being. That's something that we want to be able to provide for members. So, so we do that sort of thing. Regardless of how conscientious we may be, we find ourselves focused somewhere else, usually in the past, sometimes in the future. But when we have that experience, we face a choice. We can wander further, or we can bring attention back to breathing sensations once again. I love the parties that we have. You get to see people. A lot of times uh, you'll see people that you worked with like 15 years ago. Now they've got grandkids. So that's really fun. And it's nice to know you're part of the union that you're all looking at the same thing. You all want to know how can we make this university the best. But I am very grateful for the position that I'm in because I, I do love my job. And I also am grateful for the benefits that we have 
till this day, I don't take anything for granted. I really enjoy coming to the university. Mary just got nominated for a staff award in AMP. Oh my gosh. And we're also proud of her. Like, this is the thing. We all know each other. We work together. We're happy for each other each other's achievements and she really deserves it because she's amazing with students. No, you, so on, well, you, on a, on a prorated basis. So it says on a prorated basis, in accordance with the proportion of full-time hours worked, you're entitled to maternity, parental. No, so that's not true. You, you do, you do get maternity and parental leave. That's interesting. Um, because even if you are a grant employee, you should, let's see. So those are, uh, protesters working with Martin Luther King Jr. And, you know, what a lot of people don't know about Martin Luther King Jr. is actually when he was uh, marching, he was marching with sanitation workers who were trying to unionize, right? So, you know, even Martin Luther King Jr., you know, he's known as an activist for, for you know, uh, ending racial segregation, but he was also a big proponent of the labor movement. People, this is great. Yes. Hopefully we get more, hopefully we get a full, uh, a packed crowd, because it's uh, elections are a big thing. To allow equal opportunity for all members, each member shall only raise one point or question until all those who wish to speak have had the opportunity to do so after each report. But since January, um, QB 1356, UFA and ourselves have been pushing the employer to sit down and actually start making some changes which will benefit the membership. And not just USA, but everyone, since there's only one pension plan in New York. So um, this has been quite the struggle to get them to where we're at right now. So the first AGM that I actually attended, it was overwhelming. Um, just looking around and seeing all the different members and how many members there were and how, you know, the just the size of it. Is there a chance that the, the university will take whatever it is the cost for the use of members to take part of that retirement without penalty and use it to cost our current contract? Report went out in hard copy and then subsequent to that a clarification went out regarding the smoking policy uh, by email. It was like, like I said, it was intimidating, but it was heartwarming to know that, you know, you're part of this. Um, this organization and you know and you're all you know you work together and you you help each other you support each other if I may uh, Julia we haven't always agreed it's been, we've had fun but I'm surprised you're not running again but I do want to say thank you for your service yeah. Yeah. I advocated really hard for there to be an informal and yet structured uh, opportunity for um, members to come and meet the candidates, not with the, the the formal structure of specific questions being asked, but so they can have more of a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation. So I think it's really important just to have an informal meeting and just get to chit chat with people and not really have any kind of set agenda. I thought these are things we need to do to be inclusive and start to mentor and share our ideas and build this union into a great independent democratic union that it needs to be.
candidates can't go around to union members' offices and you know harass them at their workplace sort of deal. So an, you know, an open forum sort of like this is a perfect opportunity to ask whatever questions you may have for the candidates, have the candidates just talk to you one on one. And so you're running for the same position, for the same but position. you're friends. And so yeah, we're friendly. We sit on a couple committees together, and there's uh, a collegiality and a respect. So Lorraine running for the same position that I'm running for has no bearing on my personal relationship with Lorraine. I, she's a wonderful person. I'm delighted she wants to be involved. We have what is called a collective bargaining agreement. So it is a booklet that spells out what our rights and responsibilities as union members are within an organization. Although a limited term has 12 months to find a job, if they find it one day past four months, they go back to, they have a new seniority date. The bargaining committee is comprised of seven different people. So the president, the vice president, the Glendon rep, two members at large, and a long time service employee. Our collective agreement goes from August 1st to July the 31st. It's typically a three year contract. And so where, you know, whenever we talked to them afterwards and we said, listen, we'll make sure this will happen again, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, no, we're canceling the whole program. No more stewards for you ever. I mean, that's, that's really disproportionate, right? And then as it gets down to it, once we get rolling, we'll meet once a week. We may meet a couple times a week. We may meet every two. It all depends. If we want to train our stewards, and I thought that was the purpose of this, that's the goal. is this the primary purpose or is it not? They're the second last meeting, we, we had a 15 hour day uh, just because there was great dialogue going back and forth. Who but cares? It's not, it's not written down. They don't right? have to follow yeah, that. They only have to follow, they only have to follow what's there. there. Uh, and then our last meeting we had with them face to face was a 22 hour day. I can't believe they would say, sorry, f you, five minutes later, go back to your office. <laughs> and I think they're like, I mean, I, like, that to be reasonable. We had the momentum and we were going in a positive direction and then it, we kind of hit a wall, which was quite unfortunate, so. Yeah. And it ended at what time? Uh, 5.40 a.m. the next morning. Hi, Chris. Uh, I guess you were on lunch. Uh, it's about five to one. I, I left the voicemail on your cell as well. If, uh, it's Julio. If you can contact me, uh, the bargaining team needs to run uh, some uh, articles around Article 18 by you. And usually with bargaining, you know, you don't go long hours until you're right at the end and you feel like you're going to get a deal and you'll do anything to get the deal, which means you could stay up all night. We've actually done like 48 hours in a row. We never slept. We just kept going, going, going. You might have more of them after, but you still have those skills. But the admin that you were doing it in that, in that place, let's just say geography, and you're talking about merging geography with environmental studies. Actually, it was a mediator. I fell asleep and the mediator was like in the room. I didn't even know I was sleeping. And it was like, I don't know, probably 4.30 or something in the morning. So I'm sorry, but I agree with this. Okay. After 16 so years on this agreement. I actually remember once where me and Joni um, were on the phone to each other talking just so that we wouldn't fall asleep. So we just kind of talked to each other the whole way home so that we knew we would make it home, right? I'm just saying, we should tell him, our legal counsel says that this is not what you're saying it means, right? And that's going to convince him to change. No, but it'll tell him why we're not agreeing to the language. And to the current bargaining committee, you're doing an outstanding job. We're just waiting for a favorable result, of course, as we bargain for the next collective agreement. But we always expect to either maintain what we have or to advocate for more that the membership needs. So everyone's doing a great job. Thank you. We don't want to be gatekeeping, but we do need to verify who mm -hmm. people are. 
So you're going to cross the name off the list, hand a ballot. We also have at each station um, the info that went out on the listserv. I shouldn't say this. Oh, so, so, so the ones that come yeah. in without their so specific the ballot okay. in here and then another one with their name on the I think it, it's a very emotional time. Uh, you know, this is the culmination of everything. We're putting it forward to the membership. Uh, we're going to see if they accept it or not. Uh, it's also a lot of logistics involved in this. We've got over a thousand people that we've been trying to get into this room and trying to get in in an orderly fashion. So, a lot of running around, a lot of putting different pieces together. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Nashavik Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the dish of one spoon long and belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. This process has streamlined the, uh, the entire process. So eight and nine, we have brought in the, um, again, the letter that was in the back. We've now made it part of the article. Oh, they're gone. I have to tell you that I honestly thought that they wanted. I thought they were going to say we need to work from home forever. They didn't want to have to be paid in at all. And the main concern there for me is we also have the action. You guys would have to cut down your pants. You guys would have to cut down your pants. What do you think it'll get? Uh, I'm gonna go with 75. 90. 89. Make a different number. Yeah, I'm trying to. 86. <laughs> I'm gonna go with 85. 80, 80%. 80%. Yeah. 89%. I think it'll be good. <laughs> mm, 87% in favor. It'll be over 90. Yeah, I'm going for a 95% approval on this one. 90 something. <laughs> Dude, somebody tell me. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't go through the crap. Okay, we can start opening them up, right? Yeah. You planned already. Okay, two. So we'll be right back. They're spoiled. What are those two, by the way? Spoiled. Two spoiled? Yeah. They were blank. <laughs> A huge sense of relief for this to be over so and last question i heard that you recently got married is that right yeah so you were so you were a chair a co-chair of the bargaining committee and you got married i did yeah it's been uh it's been quite the year 2018 was something else i'll tell you that but uh you know that was uh that was definitely the best part <laughs> i would say you know as great as bargaining has been obviously uh Planning a wedding and getting all that settled has been uh, been quite the quite the experience added on to everything else. So, 
Um, when I think of unions, I, I think of those pictures of the Depression in the 20s and 30s and how, you know, there was a lot of uh, like Woody Guthrie songs and you, you were for the union, you were a union man or you were against the unions because you were this uh, rich fat cat. Um, I think uh, almost 100 years later, it's kind of the same thing. If everything's going well, you're not going to be worried. You're not going to be thinking about these things. If something breaks, you're suddenly trying to find, oh, who, who could fix this for me? Who could I look for? Well, it's your union. That's, that's the short of it. And who, you know, who operates the union? People just like you. And I like to think that we are all in this together. We're not here by ourselves and no one is superior to any other person. And we need each other. I can't predict the future, but even thinking about what challenges they have today that I don't necessarily have the answers for. A lot of it is about member engagement. So for the people that are like, oh, well, I want the union benefits, but I don't want the union. I think you do want a union. I, it's like the word feminist. It has a, um, people don't like the term feminist. All a feminist is, is 50% of the population is equal to the other 50% of the population. So it makes a huge difference. It gives people rights. I mean, it's that simple. It gives us rights and benefits, and uh, you know, we, a negotiating committee can go and ask people, say, what, what is it that you want? What is it that's missing that we can negotiate, that we can make better for us? What do we need? Use has been very effective at doing that. We've done very well at negotiating good contracts. We've got reasonably good benefits, we've got um, good representation when there are disputes. So it's easy for some folks to step back and say, why would I need to do any of that? You know, why rock the boat? Everything is going along well. On the other hand, there are some folks that realize that the only way that I'm going to survive in this world is if I have a strong, uh, well-organized, committed union and the only way to get that is to get involved. And we have an executive board, for example, in all the years I've, I've been on the board, which is more than 10 years, they donate so much of their time, right? Like, you know, you, th you think of unions, oh, it's, it's, you know, people are paid to do this stuff. Most of the people, they volunteer their time, they take time away from their family, from their friends, from their personal life. So I think how USA stands out um, is that we do a lot of things for our members to keep them engaged. And without people still fighting the fight, we'll lose all of that. That's the part that people don't realize. So it's important that people always be involved. I am of an age, I have to say, that I'm really glad I'm not a younger person. And, and, I, uh, and if people don't find a way to organize and fight back, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think, personally, that I could do what is happening now. I don't think I could be a president. At this point in time, it feels like it's, a, it's more than a 24-7 job. And given the current, in Ontario, political climate, the Labour Board has never been our friend. It's going to be even worse. It's going to be worse. Um, and, and there are some major battles ahead. So I think, I think Ontarians and Canadians, more broadly, are very resilient, obviously. We're resilient human beings. And we're going, to, we're going to overcome and move through whatever the political landscape is. I think USA is a very advanced union that has supported um, a lot of growth. I feel like every single person I know who works here goes above and beyond the call of duty. You know, when people say to me, why in the world did you bother unionizing? Uh, you know, um, it seems so nice here now. Uh, what did, why did you have to do all this? Because I was here during all those years, it, it just evolved. You know, I grew up with it. I mean, it's that thing of we can do it, I can't do it, but we can do it. And just knowing that and, you know, sometimes a group of people working together for the same goal, the same purpose, have an enormous amount of power. I guess when I, when I think about the the legacy of USA, like I think I think about our collective agreement, right? This is a document that has been worked on and 
iterated over 50 years, right? And to me, all of the protections we have, all of the rights we have, all of the benefits we have flow from the, the incredible hard work that's been done over this 50 years. So to me, it's like this legacy, it's a responsibility, it's a, it's a burden almost to, to not let down the, the previous people who've negotiated this contract. I'm thankful that someone had a vision, you know, and thought that, you know, secretaries could be involved in a union and make a difference. And without those people believing in us, you know, where would we be today? I can't even imagine. So it's just, it's an honor to have, you know, somebody who would work that hard um, for the betterment of people in general. The executive boards after I resigned, uh, I think have been, almost all of them have been admirable in their efforts to try and broaden uses, abilities, the resources available. 50 years is a very long time and there's been a lot that the membership has gone through. 50 years, it's, it's a milestone, right? And it's a testament to, I think, our longevity. But I think it's a, a testament, you know, we only have that longevity because we have the engagement of our members. It's incredible that USA is turning 50. I think USA is really strong as it is. It's, it's a strong foundation. We can definitely build on it. USA Pui will continue to be this strong, independent union that fights for the workers' rights. I'm thrilled to see it uh, as it is today and I hope it continues. <laughs>